there is a great um, presence or power of God that is in the atmosphere to do great things right now. And I told him, I said, man, it's palatable. I can feel it. I can just feel it. it. The atmosphere is so full of the energy of God. And he is, he is breaking forth in great ways. I want to make sure that my own personal life is aligned so that when God moves, I'm in alignment with his movement. And I want this church in alignment with God so that when the power of God moves through the atmosphere to this city, that we are in alignment with the will of God, the perfect will of God, so that we can do exactly as God would have us to do. Because we have it in our mind how things are going to work. And rarely have I ever experienced a time or read in the Bible when somebody had it in their mind how something was going to work and it worked just that way. Usually God just comes around and says, it's going to work exactly opposite of what you think. So um, we just need to be in alignment with that. And, and putting ourselves, our spirit, our, our minds in alignment with that. And God will use this church. And when I say this church, I'm not talking about the building. That's your hands. That's your mouth. That's your feet. God will use you in bringing forth his will in this city. Amen. So excited to hear our pastor tonight. Amen. So God bless you, Brother Dobbs, if you'd come. Let's give the Lord a good hand clap of praise. Praise Him. Adore Him. Glorify Him. Can we do that right now? Lord, we love you, praise you, exalt you, magnify you, worship you with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. And everybody say praise the Lord. I just want to say what a joy it has been to be with you, and I'm kind of sad, too, that it's drawing close to an end. Um, I do miss my family. They sent me a picture of seafood gumbo this morning at 6 o'clock, <laughs> so I know what they had for lunch, uh, and I know that they're having a wonderful time, and they said they had a great service at our church uh, earlier today, and so I am so thankful that there is a great move of God that is taking place, and it's happening here, too. Can everybody say amen? amen. Hallelujah. And I, I know you're standing, so I'll be brief, but I just want to thank Brother and Sister Mendenhall and all of you as the church for your kindness, how kind you have been to me. I don't feel like I'm worthy of that. I sure didn't come expecting it, um, you know, because I, I don't feel like I'm worthy of, of the kindness and the favor that I receive. But I really appreciate everything that everybody has done and even taking me fishing. And I know it's not quite seasoned yet, but they took me anyway, and we got one. <laughs> and I was standing there saying, Father, now, he's been kind enough to take us out here, and, and I know it's not quite the right time, but I believe you can make every fish in this sea bite if you wanted to. So I'm just asking you to let one bite. I should have asked for ten, <laughs> but, but we did have one <laughs> that I was able to catch. So, and then uh, Brother Scott caught one. So anyway, we had a good time. And uh, well, he got two, I think. But anyway, uh, it's just been a great time of fellowship. And then with the men yesterday, I really did enjoy being all of you great men. And uh, I, I never want to make you think for a moment that I think I have arrived because I get up every morning and have to face the fact that I haven't, that I'm still on my way. And so we all are. And this is a relationship. And relationships grow. Can you say Amen. amen. So uh, I hope that I have been able to be an encouragement. That's all I want to be, is an encouragement to you to live for God with all of your heart, to be the best you can be. And sometimes we don't, until we get a glimpse of where we could go, we don't know, how, we don't know that it is there to go to. And so, you know, I think it's awesome that God has given us a glimpse of where he wants us to go. But the great thing about it is, he's going to help you get there. <laughs> Amen? And I know that I have, I have made some questions here because, uh, well, I, I don't know if it's me that's done it, but I've come to announce something that God has desired to do. And so I know that you're wondering, okay, well, how are we going to walk in this new level? Well, you know, your pastor and pastor's wife and the leadership of this church have led you to this level that you've walked in 
for so long, and they will lead you into the next one. Your pastor already has a grip on this, and he knows what God is going to do, and he's going to slowly take you into this level just like he taught, taught you how to be a warrior. So you don't have any worries about that at all. You don't have to, well, I don't know, you know. Just walk forward, be obedient, be faithful, keep praying, amen, and God will lead you, and you will find yourself in a whole new direction, a whole new level, doing greater things than you've done before if you just continue to walk. That's why you have a shepherd, amen, and I'm going to do my best to be his shepherd, and I'm honored, I'm honored that I would be allowed to do that. We're going to Ephesians, the second chapter, verse number one. Very, very simple today. And I've just kind of labored with this because I, you know, I said, Lord, this is my last time to speak to them until next time. And if there's something that I need to address or something you need to address through me, I just don't want to miss that. So I feel a, a little bit of uh, heaviness uh, on this message more than all the others, just simply because... Uh, this is my last one for a while, you know, and I don't want to uh, I don't want to leave anything undone that the Father has sent me to do. Ephesians, the second chapter, verse number one, and the Bible says, "And you hath He quickened." Everybody say quickened. The word there means He has made you alive. Turn to somebody and say, "He has made you alive." Turn to somebody else and say, "You never live till you live for Jesus." <laughs> <laughs> he has made you alive when you were dead or slain by your trespasses and sin. Now, I'm reading from the Amplified. I'm, I'm, I'm about to read from the King James. And ye, you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. You were dead, but you've been made alive. Wherein in time past, ye walked accordingly to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath even as others. But God, how many is glad he's in the equation? But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sin, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath, everybody say hath. hath. That means past tense. He has raised us up together, made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kingdom toward us through Christ. For by grace you are saved through faith, and not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And then verse 19, Now therefore... Ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostle, prophets, Jesus Christ himself, being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for a habitation of God through his Spirit. Now, I know that it, again, looks like Paul is just being an orator, and he's saying a bunch of fancy words here, but some of these words he spoke under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost are some of the most powerful words that your ears will ever hear, because you may look at where you are now or where you have been and say, I sure have a long way to go, and it's going to take me a long time to get there. Someone said that this very morning. But the Lord would say to you, there's one thing you're forgetting about. God is in the picture. And with God, he can accelerate things. And with God, he can clarify things. 
And before you know it, if you put your first foot forward, he will meet you where you are, and he will take you where he wants you to go, and you will become what he wants you to be, and it will be all to his glory, because today he makes you alive. I want you to put your Bible down, and I want you to thank God that he is going to help you to become what he desires you to be. Would you do it right now? Lord God, we thank you, Jesus, that you are the help. You are the strength. You are the joy. You are the direction. You are the life in us. You are the ability in us. And we want to praise you and glorify you and magnify you for all that you have done, all that you're doing right now, and all that you are going to do in the future. We bless your name. We praise your name. We exalt your holy name. In Jesus' name, would you just praise him? Praise him for where he's taking you. Praise him for what he's going to make of you. Praise God. Praise God. And let everybody say praise the Lord. And you may be seated. The first thing we have to understand is that God can only use nothing. Now, in this world, we're always trying to be somebody. The pressure of this world is for you to become somebody. Success is gauged by your peers on whether you do things the way everybody thinks is acceptable. And if you are doing it the way everybody thinks it should be done, then you are called a success. But God calls a success something completely different. We have to understand that the power of the Holy Ghost is the power to make us become from what we are to what he wants us to be. So you may feel like nothing. And if you do, you are exactly what God's looking for. Because if you feel like you're something, then he has to make you nothing before he can use you. You know, there's a lot of guys that are trying to be something special, and they're doing it by their own power. The only problem with that is it takes a lot of work to do that. <laughs> because if you try to do something that is supposed to be done in the spirit, in the flesh, it'll kill you. It'll kill you because you constantly have to do everything you can to make it come alive, to make it alive. You know, that's why I've said it before, and I'll say it again. There's a lot of churches that are, are resulting to, or are, they're beginning to use entertainment instead of inspiration to try to build a crowd in their church. Well, the only problem is where does it end? Because they have to become, they have to continually outdo themselves. You know, there was an artist uh, that maybe some of you might, uh, might have heard of before, and he was a dear friend of mine, still is, and that uh, the, you might have heard songs by Carmen back in the, the, the 90s, and I'm dating myself. <laughs> but I was a DJ when I first met Carmen, and, and he called me on, on, at the radio station, and I featured him on one of our shows, and, and uh, then we became friends. And uh, when I would talk to Carmen, I would always tell him, I said, dude, you are your biggest competition, <laughs> I mean, you come out of, anybody ever heard a song by Carmen before? Yeah. You know, some of you, you, some of you are dating yourself now, you know. <laughs> but uh, this guy, would, his songs were not just songs. They were stories, and he, he had actions, and he had special effects. And, I mean, this guy was amazing, and, and he was just one of a kind. There wasn't anybody else like him out there. And, and, but his songs would be so amazing. When he finished, you'd just be sitting there going, wow, uh -huh. because it'd be such a revelation in the song. And I told him, I said, you're, you're your worst competition. You're your only competition, but you have to outdo yourself every album because you keep getting better and better, but I'm just wondering where is it going to end? And, you know, and we would say things like that, just joking, but he was his greatest competition because he was kind of one of a kind. Well, I'm going to tell you something. That's exactly what happens in this world. When we start trying to get better and better, all of a sudden we get to a place where we just come to an end of ourself, and at the end of ourself there's nowhere else to go. But when we are walking in the Spirit, we came to the end of ourself a long time ago. You will never find the greatness of God until you come to the end of yourself. You have to come to the end of your own opinions. You have to come to the end of your own traditions. What are traditions? Traditions are things you believe that you can't prove in the Scripture. You know, well, that's the way we've always done it. Well, if it's not biblical, it doesn't work. Okay? 
That's just plain and simple. If it's not biblical, it doesn't work because it was not born of the Spirit. It was born by the thoughts of men. I'm not interested in what men think. I'm interested in what God is saying. If you base your life upon what men think, you will constantly have to outdo yourself to try to impress them in a greater measure. You know, I saw it so many times as a DJ that you would see singers that would uh, come out with a hit song, and then they'd have to come out with another hit song because their, their, their fans are starting to move to somebody else because they haven't come out with something that's a hit, and, and then they'd have to feel the pressure of coming out with a hit, and sometimes just the pressure of that would cause things to happen in their life that would make them completely ineffective. And I've seen them crash and burn simply trying to outdo what they did the first time. Because men's minds, when I say men, I'm not just about men, I'm talking about women, I'm talking about everybody. Our minds are fickled. <laughs> you never know what people are going to say is the next trend. You know, I've lived long enough to see a pet rock. And then a chia pet. What? I don't want that in my house. And then the mood rings. I mean, what are they going to come up with? There is no telling. I mean, especially in this media world, there is no telling what is going to come up next. And it might be something we don't need to have anything to do with. But it's because man is constantly pursuing stuff and trying to outdo themselves and trying to go viral with something else because they went viral with something a, a few months ago and they're trying to keep up with, with the pace. And, and I'm telling you, it's a rat race and the rats always win. But in the church, you have a loving God. You have a compassionate God. He loves you as you are, and he wants to transform you into what he desires. You have nothing to prove to him. You can't hide anything from him. <laughs> you know, you can't say, well, I don't want you to know about that. He's like, too late. I knew about it before you did it. I knew you were going to do it. Isn't it something that we can't do anything to surprise God? It's like, I knew that. I already knew that. <laughs> I knew you were capable of that. You know, we, oh, God, please forgive me. I can't believe I did that. He said, I can. But I love you anyway. You see, the fact is, you cannot do anything in your life to make God love you more than he loves you right now. Because when God loves, he doesn't know where to stop. He loves with all of his heart. He loved you in your sin. Now, did he love you to stay in your sin? No, because if you stay in your sin, you're lost. You know, and it's like a, a, it's like a parent that has a child that is rebellious, and you love them, but it kind of hurts to love them because of what they're doing to themselves. And you hurt because you know they'll never be what you thought they could be because they're destroying themselves. Everybody understand what I'm saying? So it's not that God doesn't love you. God loves you. God's not angry at you. God's not even judging you right now. The Word is judging you. You say, well, if God's not judging me, how come the preacher's preaching on my toes? It's not the preacher. It's the Word. God said, look, I love you. I loved you before you came to me. I love you even in your failure. I love you when you mess up. I love you when you're doing good, and I love you when you're not doing so good. I'm going to love you with all of my heart. But it's up to you to love me enough to let me make you what I desire you to be because what I desire you to be is for your own good. Remember, we've already established God is good. So if God is good, then what he wants for you is good. He does, there's no way he could want something evil for you because he doesn't even know how to do evil. He, he wants what's good for you. So the things that the Bible that commands us to do, you know, we call them restrictions, and we, we want to rebel against them. But the things that God is requiring of you, the things that God convicts you about whenever you are in his presence or you're in prayer, and God said, now that, I don't like that. That's not good for you. Now, you don't need to be doing this anymore because this isn't good. And you just see it as restrictions. But what he is is that he's good. And what he's trying to do is bring you to a place of being good. The rich young ruler came to Jesus and asked him. Now, why did he ask Jesus, how do I get eternal life? 
Jesus had been teaching on eternal life. And so the rich young ruler says, well, how do I get eternal life? And he said, well, the first thing you need to do is obey the commands of God. And he said, well, I've been doing that since I was a little kid, you know. <sighs> That's called self-righteousness, by the way. <laughs> and he called Jesus good, good master. So Jesus first said, well, you need to, you, you know, uh, why, first of all, let's address something that, that is, what you, is your main problem. Why did you call me good? Because, you see, you thinking that you call me good means that I'm going to call you good. The fact that you're calling me good tells me that you think men are good and men aren't good. And he said, so let's clarify one thing right now. Only God is good. You see, if I have any good in me, it's God. If you have any good in you, it's God. The Holy Ghost in you is the good in you. You know what that does? That puts us all on the same level ground now. We're all imperfect humans. We all make mistakes. We all do things we wish we never would have done, and we wish we could forget. Can somebody say amen? amen. There is nobody in this room that cannot say you have never failed and you've never done. If you're perfect, I want to know your secret. And the first thing we need to do is pray for you for lying. Because there's nobody perfect. There's nobody good. You can't be good without God. And that, what is he, that's what he told the young man. He said, you've kept all these rules. And now you think because you've kept all these rules, you're good. The fact is, you're still not good. And if you went and sold everything you had and gave to the poor, you still wouldn't be good. The only way you're going to be good is for you to follow me. Does everybody understand? So how are you going to go from where you are now, and you may have some regrets. You may feel like, man, I don't know if I'll ever overcome this. I don't know if I can get beyond this. I don't know if I could do this. You know, and, and I remember, man, I remember looking at the, when I first came to a Pentecostal church, I was 11 years old, and, and, and when I walked into my first Pentecostal church, I had to dodge a guy that was running the aisles. And I'm 11. I haven't hardly been in church my whole life. And I'm, I'm, I'm not expecting a race when I come into a sanctuary. And I opened the door and, what was that? I'm backing up. Mama said, don't worry about it. It's okay. We're Pentecostal. I said, you're crazy. What was that? A man running in church? Who's he running from? That's what I want to know. I mean, that was so weird to me, and I'm just a kid. You say, well, it might be strange to you, but I'm going to tell you something. Now I understand that man became so overwhelmed by the Spirit of God, he had to do something. Anybody been there before? It's like, I have got to do something. What do I do with all this I'm feeling right now? And I feel the Holy Ghost right now. So I'm telling you, as I stayed there, I'm thinking, I'll never be like this bunch. They're crazy. But the more I stayed around them, the crazier I get, I got, I guess. The more I begin to understand, the more I begin to embrace. And all of a sudden, I started feeling when God filled me with the Holy Ghost. It was like, oh, my goodness. You know, I remember I got the Holy Ghost at home. <laughs> We'd been in revival for, back then, you could have revival for six weeks, seven nights a, a week, <laughs> and eight if there was one that you could find. <laughs> and so, you know, we had been in church for six weeks. You're either sanctified or exhausted, one of the two. And I'm I'm in my I'm in my bedroom, and I knelt down that day. It was in the summer. I, I never forget. It was in the summer, June eighth, and uh, and I knelt down and I was praying. And I said, Lord, I've been praying for the Holy Ghost at at, at the church every night, and I'm having a hard time for, for some reason receiving the Holy Ghost. And I know now why. I just had a lot of unforgiveness in my heart, even as a child, and and all, and because of what I've been through. And and the Lord spoke to me when I woke up that morning. First time He'd ever done that. He said. You know, I could give you the Holy Ghost right here. Really? In the house? Not just at the church? You know, I believe the Lord filled me with the Holy Ghost at the house because that set a precedent in my life. And all of a sudden now, this isn't a church thing. This is a 24 hours a day, seven days a week thing. So I'm kneeling there beside the bed. I started weeping, praising God. And then, 
just started talking in tongues. I was so excited. I jumped up, left the bedroom, walked in the kitchen. Mama's cooking supper, lunch. And I looked at her to tell her I got the Holy Ghost, and I'm just speaking in tongues. She turns around, looks at me. She is stunned in the kitchen. She grabs my hands. We start dancing and shouting. I mean, the first person I ever shouted with had an apron on. <laughs> Holy Ghost hit me, and it looked like a newborn calf trying to learn how to walk on ice skates. <laughs> I started shouting and dancing. When I opened up my eyes, I am under the kitchen table. Looking up at Made in England. <laughs> like, what in the world? Where, how did I get here? And Mama's pulling me out by foot. <laughs> she said, you all right? I said, I, I, I am so happy. I have been happy ever since. I haven't found anything that makes you feel like that. I haven't found anything that makes you rejoice like that. It has kept me in the dark times. It has kept me in the difficult times. It has kept me through my teenage years, through the time when people made fun of me, called me holy moly and all of this stuff. I'm telling you, there is nothing like Jesus. And I was 11 years old when God gave me the Holy Ghost. And so I went to church and I told the pastor I got the Holy Ghost. He was so excited. Because I was a bad kid. I didn't know any better. But you know what? The Holy Ghost began to change me and began to transform the way I thought. And then I started having, teach, I taught my first Bible study to myself. You know, because I just wanted to know. I bought my first Bible and I decided I was going to underline everything in it that I thought was great. I still have that Bible. And almost every word in the book is underlined. <laughs> I read the whole thing through in six months. I devoured it. I'm like, wow. You know, I didn't know. Nobody told me. You don't read the whole Bible. What in the world? Are you crazy? You just read little piss pieces of Just little bits and pieces all you read. You know, you don't read the whole book. I didn't know it's a book. I read it. And then I read it again. And, the, and then I, when I read it the second time, I said, is this the same book? Because I don't remember seeing that last time. And the third time I went, whoa, where did that come from? But God was feeding me. I, you know what? It wasn't until later on when I was about 12 and a half that God, God called me to preach. I wasn't reading the Bible because I was looking for sermon material. I was reading the Bible because I wanted to know him. And I'm going to tell you, I'm just being real with you today. If you're looking for something that will fulfill your life, if you're looking for someone that will transform you into his image and make you into his likeness, that is the greatest thing about God. God is not saying, okay, I'm God and you're the peon and that's your, all you're going to ever be. No, he's God and he wants you to be like him. He wants to transform you into him. He wants you to grow into the fullness of the stature of Jesus Christ. We're not just serving him because we want to be saved. We're not trying to be good so we can go to heaven. The reason that God gave us the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues is so that you could slowly, slowly become what he is and do what he does. And he even looked at his disciples and he said, you look at the things I'm doing and you're going, man, I could never do that. They even tried and failed. You know, the people came up to Jesus and said, we tried to get your disciples to cast out this demon and they couldn't do it. And Jesus looked at him and said, well, you know, they, they got a long way to go. <laughs> this only comes by prayer and fasting and I can't get them to skip a meal. <laughs> so... You know, he was, he was rebuking them, but he was also telling the people, they'll, they'll do it. Later on, he looked at me and said, and greater work shall you do than what you've seen me do. You see, because I'm not a jealous God to the point that I don't want you to be like me. I'm going to transform you, and you're going to be able to do greater things than I have showed you that you could do. Uh, the reason that Jesus came was to exhibit sonship, to show you what a son of God looks like so you could be a son of God. You know, God the Son is not even a term that's in the Bible. It's Son of God. 
And not only was he the son of God, but he was also the son of man. On his mama's side, he was the son of man. On his daddy's side, he was the son of God. You know what? On my mama's side and my daddy, my earthly daddy, I'm the son of man. But on my heavenly father's side, I can be a son of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when we see him, we shall be like him. Is that in the book? Yep, sure is. Because that's what he wants to do. He's hoping that you will fellowship with him enough that you will become like him. So he looks at this young man, and I want you to understand, he was not angry at this young man. The Bible said he had compassion on him. Because he realized that he was wrong. And he realized that his thinking was wrong. And he said, look, first of all, we got to clear up the stinking thinking. You think you're good because of what you've done. I don't live in holiness and abstain from things that are impure to make me good. Okay? I do it because I love him. I am madly in love with him, and I don't want to do anything that makes him unhappy. I tell him that every day. Now, Father, don't you let me do a single thing that would make you unhappy. Just If I'm about to do something that would make you unhappy, I want to put a smile on your face, and I want you to smile all day long. Don't let me do it. Now, it's not because I'm scared of him. It's because I love him. My motivation is not that I just got saved and I want to try to stay saved. For one thing, let's just be real. I'm, I'm about to kill a cow. A sacred cow is about to die. Getting saved is a man-made notion. Okay? Because if, is, if getting saved is of God, then once you're saved, you're always saved. But you see, that doctrine of once saved, always saved basically says some are born to go to heaven and some are born to go to hell. That's not the book. Jesus said it's for whosoever will let him come. You see, when people say, well, I got saved when I was 11. Well, I received the Holy Ghost when I was 11, and that began a relationship with him. But I promise you, just like a marriage, I've had to work hard at it to keep it alive. I've had to decide many, many times that I was going to stay married. To Jesus. Because you call it salvation, he calls it marriage. By the way, you are the bride of Christ. And we are waiting for our groom to come get us. And we owe it to him that we stay pure and have no other lovers. Amen? Amen? So the reason that I try to live pure in his sight by his power, not mine, the reason that I try to please him by the power of the Holy Ghost, not mine, is because I am in love with him, and I don't want to make my lover unhappy. He is my husband-to-be. I am the bride of Christ. He is coming to get me one day at the sounding of the trumpet, and I want to know that I can look him in the eye and say, I have been faithful to you because you gave me your spirit to help me be faithful. Because the reason I'm living the way I'm living is because I intend to have fellowship with my king for eternity. And I don't ever want to sit there and think, you know what, I wasn't faithful to him. I had other lovers. You see, that's why we can't. That's why you can't serve two masters. You can't live in this world and go after the things of this world that God hates. Every morning, you've got to get up and say, God, I want to be like you. I want to be compatible with you so that whenever we spend eternity together sitting beside one another in heaven, because the Bible says that the bride is going to be sitting on the throne with him. We are going to be ruling and reigning with him. We are not going to be standing before the throne. There will be people that are, but there's going to be people that's going to be sitting on the throne. And uh, sitting on the throne is the bride of Christ, where the bride belongs, right next to the husband. And we're going to be able to say, you know what? We fought a good fight, and we were faithful, and we, we love the Lord with all of our heart, and we tried to stay pure from the unclean things of this world. We tried to hate the things he hated and love the things he loved. We tried to be like him in every way we can, and we couldn't do it by ourselves. The only way we could do it was by his hand. So he gave us the comforter. He gave us the teacher. 
He gave us strength in the Spirit. He gave us, He made us alive in Him. And that is the Holy Ghost. So when you receive the Holy Ghost, you're dead in trespasses of sin, but you repent. And, you know, when you repent, you die in your sin. And so anything that dies, you have to bury. So we're buried with him in baptism. And then after we are baptized in Jesus' name, we are resurrected. And the resurrection is the infilling of the Holy Ghost. And so that, when I, that happens, you're not getting saved. You are getting a relationship. The Bible said, he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Is that what the Bible says? That means when I hear the pearly gates click behind me, and I hear him say, well done, thy good and faithful servant, I just got saved. <laughs> Until then, I am walking in a relationship, and because he's so merciful, I have to decide every day, if I'm going to walk in it. You know, I'll tell you, when the Lord began to deal with me about this, I have a mantle that I pray in. And the Lord told me, he said, this mantle represents the place that I'm taking you in the Spirit for you to walk in a, in a spiritual authority. And I remember, I know it may sound strange, and if somebody had been sitting in the audience, of course it was just me at the church that day, they'd have thought I was insane. I'm walking around this, I had this little podium like this, and I had it hanging on it. And I'm walking around and saying, God, I do not want to put that on until I know that I'm willing to do what that requires. Even this very morning, the Holy Ghost spoke to me. He said, are you happy, Michael? I said, yes, sir, I am. He said, you remember when I began to deal with you about leaving your security and walking away from a church you've pastored for 30 years? The Lord, this morning, this morning. I said, yes, sir, I do. He said, you remember how fearful you were? I said, I'm Totally. Yes, sir. I do. I struggled with it for a couple of years because I was just so afraid of walking away from everything that I'd known for 30 years. That was my security, not mine only, but my wife's. I knew that if, if I stepped into what God wanted me to do, I'm just being candid with you. I wasn't going to see my grandkids all the time. They live a mile from my house. I see them about six days out of the month. I said, yeah, I remember that day. He said, are you happy? Because if you're not happy, I wouldn't ask you to do this. I said, Father, the question is, are you happy? And he said, yes, I'm very happy about this. I said, then if you're happy, I'm happy. Because I'm a servant. And I'm a son. And I would not be happy if I was not making you happy. That's just the way it is. So if you're happy with what I'm doing, I want to thank you that you have, you have been my security. You have taken care of every bill that I've had to pay, including the $15,000 worth of flight tickets. <laughs> I said, you've taken care of me. You've been so kind to me. You've been so compassionate to me. Every year I end up on a zero of the debt that I had to accrue to be able to do what you told me to do. And nobody can explain it, not even me. I said, but if you're happy, then I'm happy. And I know that there'll come a time when I'll be able to enjoy my family more so. But if this is what you need me to do, I could not sleep at night if I did not know that I was doing what you wanted me to do. Now, I'm not bragging. Don't think for a moment I'm boasting. I am not boasting. I am being candid with you, probably too candid. But I'm telling you, we've got to come to the place where it really doesn't matter whether we're happy or not as long as he is. Because I'll tell you that I have found that if you will make him happy, you will have joy unspeakable and full of glory. I have met the nicest people. I have been treated the kindest of ways. You know, I, I go to Greece and they kiss me on both cheeks. I am Greek. They don't even like Americans, but they seem to like me. I don't know why. It's just the favor of God. And, and we, are, we are having a great revival, a great move of God in Greece. We're having a, I got a message today from Australia. They've been watching these services. <laughs> 
Not while we're here doing it for sure, but in their time zone. And they're saying, you know, it's just powerful what God's doing there. And I said, yeah, it's a great church. Put them on your prayer list and pray for Sadatna because it's going to be a, it's going to be a church you're going to know about. It's, going to, it's evolving into that now. You know, and I'm just telling them that. And we've got people in Norway that's been watching these services that, that you know, that I met. And, and, and I, I've, got, I've got people all over the world. And, 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 you know, I've never dreamed that would ever happen. I never dreamed I'd be where I am. But it's only because I said, God, hey, whatever makes you happy is what I want to do. I just want to be pleased to you. I just want to make you happy. Let me tell you, I can testify to you. That's what I'm doing. That if you will give your life completely to God, he will make you more alive than you've ever been. And you will have joy unspeakable beyond your wildest dreams. Is it always rosy? No. There are times whenever I know I'm in danger, but the Holy Ghost is with me to protect me. There's times when my wife is worried and just wanting to get me out of wherever I am. They have prayed me out of countries before. When I was just a few footsteps away from ISIS, the, you know, I, I have been in danger. I have been in situations. I, I have seen it. I, I know what it is to feel death in the air and know that anything could happen at any moment. I've gone through more military checkpoints than I want to admit. But one day I went through eight, and they never saw me. How did they not see this? The missionary said, Brother Dobbs, you are invisible today. I said, I guess I am. Because they would look at every, with their machine guns, they would look at every window and talk to everybody in the car. But they never came to me. Eight times in one day, seven or eight times in one day. He said, what is the, it got to be funny. We're pulling up to another one. I said, okay, God, you did it last time. <laughs> Because if they see I'm an American, I could be in very, very grave danger. These are rebels. Lord, here we go again. And I just sit there. Maybe they didn't see me because I was dead still. <laughs> they never saw me. Never saw me. The whole day. We got to the campground, and I got out, and I said, can you all see me? Because <laughs> I've been invisible today. All I could do was go into my little makeshift room there in that little shanty with the, with the grass roof and say, God, you are so good. You're so amazing. I, I can't believe what you just did today. But you know what? I can say that it is because I want to please him. And if you would make up your mind and say, you know what? The only thing that I'm really interested in is pleasing the Lord. If I can live my life, it doesn't matter if everybody else thinks I'm crazy and old-fashioned and out of step. If I can just live my life giving him thanks for saving me from hell. I was headed to hell. Do you hear me? You don't hear a lot of preachers preach about that anymore. But Jesus talked more about hell than he did heaven. I was going to hell. And he had mercy on me. And at, at, at 11 years old, he drew me toward him and filled me with the Holy Ghost. At 12 and a half, he called me to be a preacher. And everybody thought that was funny. But I'm going to tell you something. There was something that happened in me, and I said, you know what? I have a heavenly Father. He is watching over me. I have nothing to fear, and I will give him everything I've got in my life. I will give him my energy, my love, my desire, and even through high school when I was made fun of, I was called Holy Moly because <laughs> I have a mole on my chin. <laughs> Y'all didn't notice? Really? It's perfectly in the center. God knows what he's doing. You know why I know that? Because doctors have measured it before. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was called preacher man, and it wasn't a compliment. <laughs> but I got elected in the student council as the chaplain of the high school. <laughs> Who else would run for that? You know what? I just made up my mind. And my kids are the same way. I told them, so look, you're holy seed. People are going to make fun of you because you're out, of, you're out of step with the rest of the world. It's because you're, you're marching to a different drummer, and he's the best drummer in the world. You're going to seem strange to some people because your mind is not like their mind because you have purposely surrendered your mind to Christ, and you have the mind of Christ. 
And they're going to make fun of you because you don't do the things that they want to do. But the fact of the matter is they know they're wrong and they're doing them because they're not happy. Why should you do them if you're already happy? Just be happy in Jesus. Find real joy. And you won't have to find the other stuff that they're having to do to try to fill the emptiness. If you'll go ahead and fill the emptiness as a child, then you won't have the emptiness. I'm not better than anybody in this house or anybody in this world. I'm just telling you, at an early age, I made up my mind. I don't even know why I'm doing this, but this is what the Holy Ghost told me to do. You, you know what? All I'm looking forward to is pleasing him and one day having fellowship with him and sitting beside him, and that will make everything I ever have to do worth it all. It has gone far beyond living for him because I don't want to go to hell. That's not even in the equation anymore. It's because, you know what? Lord, you let me get too close to you. And now I've seized hold on you like Jacob did. And I am not going to let you go until you bless me. Until you make me what you are. Until you help me become what you are. Until you make me like you. I am not going to let go. Is there anybody else here? Amen. You say, well, I don't know if I can do that. You can't. But that's what the Holy Ghost is for. If you'll yield to the power of the Holy Ghost, you know some people say, you mean you've got to have the Holy Ghost to be saved? And then they call us legalism? In other words, they're saying, you know, unless it's a law, I don't want it. What? I want everything God's got for me. And if anybody experienced anything in the Bible, I want it. If they spoke in tongues as a spirit gave utterance in the upper room, don't let me out. I want it. Besides, how can you pray in the Holy Ghost or understand a spiritual God unless he puts his spirit in you so that you can understand him? You know, people that don't have the Holy Ghost really don't understand who he truly is. And they can't even interpret the scripture correctly because the Bible is a spiritual book. And the only way that you can understand this book is to have the writer living inside of you so that he can confirm the understanding. There is no private interpretation of this book. And the reason that some people have read Scripture and have come up with completely erroneous doctrines is because they don't have the Spirit of God that wrote it. The Holy Ghost is the author of this book. Amen? Amen. Amen. What did the Bible say? That the Spirit of the Lord was upon them that wrote this. Who is the Spirit of the Lord? It's the Ruach HaKodesh, the Spirit of the Holy One. Translated, Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost wrote this book by the hands of men. And so how can I understand what the Holy Ghost wrote unless I have the Holy Ghost in me? And I know I'm, I'm really affecting some people's traditions here, but we're not going to be judged by traditions. When you stand before the Lord, the Bible says, and the books were opened. Who, what, what are these books? One of them is the book of life. The Lamb's Book of Life to see if you have been born again. The other one is that book. And he's going to say, okay, I gave you instruction. I gave you truth. I put it in your hands. All you had to do was read it. And if you read it, I gave you my spirit that wrote the book so you could understand it. So now let's judge you by this book. Did you do what this book says you must do. Did you follow his commands? Did you follow the plan of salvation? Did you keep your life pure? Did you follow the principles of this book and, and make sure that this was the owner's manual that you followed in your life? You can't say I'm being unfair. I put this book in your hands. Folks, this life is an open book test. All you got to know is where to find it. <laughs> and I'm not going to be judged by man's traditions or by denominations, which are all man-made. I'm going to be judged by this book. That's all I'm going to be judged by. And if I am obedient to the book he put in my hands, 
and if I have received the Spirit that wrote the book so I could understand it, then he's going to say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys that lie before you because you've been faithful. What were you faithful to? I was faithful to this book. I was faithful to my relationship with him. I was faithful to the Holy Ghost that is in me, that is my daily teacher. You've heard me say, and maybe it's strange to some of your ears, the Lord spoke to me, and the Lord spoke to me, and the Lord spoke to me. And you say, oh, how in the world does God talk to you? Well, you know, he lives in me. <laughs> I get kind of disturbed if I don't hear from him on a regular basis. Because he lives right here. And he talks to me in a still, small voice. And I know his voice. The Bible says my sheep are going to know my voice. I know his voice. And I know that if I do what the voice says, according to the Scripture, because this is the open book test, that I'm not going to be astray. And that I can, I can be what God wants me to be, say what he wants me to say, do what he wants me to do, and manifest Jesus in Sodotna. Are you hearing me? That's what the Lord wants you to do. Get so close to me that you start feeling like me, acting like me, talking like me. And so the unbeliever that can't believe in anything except what they see, sees me in you. Here's me in you. Feels me in you. And all of a sudden they say, you know what? I feel like I've been with Jesus. Well, that's the highest compliment you could ever ask for. You know what? Religion will never get you there. Religion will never get you there. Because all religion is is just practicing just enough to get saved. Relationship is how you're going to get there. And relationship is marriage. And marriage is salvation. And when that woman received that ring, she was saying, you're the only man I'll love. And I'll have children for you, and I'll wash your dirty clothes, and I'll live my whole life with you, and we'll grow old together. That's what, that's what she was saying. You know what he was saying? I'll be your husband. I'll be a provider. I'll be your protector. I'll help you in any way I can. When you call on me, I'll be there. That sounds like Jesus to me. He is the ultimate bridegroom. How many's getting ready for the wedding? <laughs> you know what? I'm closing. I'm trying to close. Okay. I'm closing. At least I closed my Bible. He loves you so much, he is not going to stand or, or sit on his throne and wait for you to get there. The Bible said he will meet us in the air. Can you see him? Now, I'm going to tell you, this is how I see Jesus, okay? Y'all may think I'm silly. I can see him going, Gabriel, blow that horn. Come on, man, let's get this. Come on. I've been looking for this day for so long. Come on, hurry, hurry, hurry. I'm, in fact, you know what? Let's meet him halfway. And he's going to be seen in the air with his arms open wide and the biggest smile on his face as he begins to resurrect those that died in him and then raise up those that are alive in him and they're going to be made alive in the grave and they're going to be made alive on the earth and we are going to ascend into glory and we are going to meet the lover of our soul and it's not about a religion. It's about a relationship. We're going to meet him in the air. And then the next thing you read about is the marriage supper of the Lamb. Would you all stand with me right now? The marriage supper of the Lamb. Oh, wow. We're going to be his bride. We already are his bride in waiting. And I want to live faithful to him. How about you? I want to please him. I want to fellowship with him as much as I can. I want him to know I don't love anything more than him. Somebody say amen. amen. And if that's how you feel, I just think we ought to just make a recommitment to our love with him. Just to say to the Lord, you know what, God? I love you more than anyone, anything. 
I want to please you more than anyone, anything. I want to be more like you than anyone or anybody. Anybody willing to come and just recommit your love affair with the Lord Jesus Christ right now? God bless these are coming, and anybody that wants to, even our guests are welcome to come. You, you can come and join us. We're not going to do anything. We're not going to, we're not going to do anything you don't want us to do as far as pray with you or whatever. We just.